Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, not very sure if we have any good evenings. But uh, yeah, my name is uh, my name is Muhammad uh, Ita. Uh, everyone calls me Ita, um, obviously because uh, Muhammad is the most common name in Egypt. Uh, this is where I'm from. This is where I'm uh, calling in uh, today. So uh, uh, I actually uh, came to visit family and. Uh, I uh, I now stay most of my time in uh, Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. Um, I have been in the fast-moving consumer goods uh, for the last probably 20 years of my career. Uh, I've done few roles in uh, commercial, uh, but mainly in marketing and uh, brand management. A um, couple of personal things about me. I'm very passionate about sports, uh, all kinds of sports. And uh, uh, obviously, soccer is like religion in Egypt, so that's that that's one of the big ones. And um, uh, I also do a lot of volunteering work. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a small NGO that I uh, started with my wife, uh, and uh, I'm now the co-founder of a company called Positive Nutrition, which uh, focuses on health and wellness uh, beverages and snacks. And uh, I'm managing the business between uh, North America and uh, Dubai. Great to meet everyone. Looking forward and uh, really looking forward for the uh, other panelists, Tamlan. So uh, up to you. Thank thanks you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Okay, so thanks a lot, Ada. And uh, I hope the beaches in Egypt are, are really filling with people right now in the holiday season. Uh, I'm dialing in from Dubai. Hi, everyone. Um, I am uh, I'm Amlan. I have been uh, in Dubai for about six, seven months. Before that, I was in sunny South Africa for five and a half years, based in Johannesburg. And before that, uh, I was in India, where I started my journey uh, in, in Reckitt. So been about 15 years in Reckitt across commercial roles, a lot of them in sales, a lot of them on uh, analytics and digital uh, in India on urban rural expansion, followed by sub-Saharan Africa based in South Africa, and now uh, heading the e-commerce uh, section for North, South and Gulf, uh, North, South Africa and Gulf. Uh, I'm, I'm not as good in soccer as Aita, so I, I would rather stick to uh, cooking as being one of my uh, hobbies, passions, but the biggest passion I have is to, uh, you know, uh, play uh, with my son, six-year-old son. He keeps me on my toes and, uh, you know, it's it's the favorite pastime of mine. Thank you all for joining. Looking forward to this uh, discussion for on a very relevant topic and hope I can contribute uh, to uh, some new learnings today. Thanks a lot, Amlal. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone whoever has joined and special thanks to Mohammed and Amlan to giving out their time today. Uh, I'll be moderating today's session. I'm Haninder. I'm the co-founder of Strategy Connect. Uh, before starting Strategy Connect, I had a very enriching stint at Booz & Company. It's one of the uh, like management consulting firms wherein I got exposure to various industries apart from FMCG as well, which is one of the topics that we have chosen today. Uh, and uh, at Strategy Connect, I think most of you have been part of our network. Uh, and thanks a lot again for joining in, tuning in uh, for, uh, for, for this topic wherein we will be deep diving into digitization and what it means for the CPG, consumer packaged goods industry. Uh, we will try to focus uh, and like touch upon what's happening in the Middle East, but we will try to also touch upon the global trends and how things have progressed and changed. So without further ado, uh, you know, I will just uh, kick off the conversations uh, and, and throw a question. Maybe, you know, we can start uh, with you, Amlan, uh, and, and, and just talk about because since you have been in the arena, uh, for more than a decade now, you have seen what happened pre-COVID, during COVID, and post-COVID. Now, if I can say that, uh, how 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 larger brands and organizations have dealt with like digitization as a topic? How has the seriousness changed uh, during this three? You know, if I have to 
like cut the time of last 15 years in these three phases in your opinion in your perspective yeah i think that's that's a very relevant time and and you rightly put it that you know whether we are in post covid or still in the similar time we don't know uh i think a few things have massively changed across this uh time period you know uh we had uh we had e-commerce as a as a specific you know customer facing consumer facing division uh and we absolutely you know uh, accelerated for 10 years of growth in one or two years depending on the categories we're talking about so clearly from a channel split or a channel uh, you know importance e-commerce certainly you know in some markets quadrupled in size and also uh, improved the you know contribution to the business uh, that's one part of it uh, a lot of businesses also realized uh, during this time that the entire value chain uh, is dependent on global uh, supply chains for example so how that has also changed is also one important point to consider post covid where uh, from a globalization point of view which was the mantra before a lot of uh, businesses uh, uh, mcs uh, alike realized that uh, possibly they are too spread thin across the globe and had to talk about the supply chain aggregation and decentralization of the uh, supply chain also uh, these are key, two key themes that Uh, we saw even in in the organization that i am in racket uh and and also it sort of pervaded across functions how from and even now we are having this uh panel discussion uh, online right uh, maybe four years back we would be talking on a stage or you know we'll be uh, let's say constrained with the logistics of getting everybody at the same place and so on so we have people from pretoria from brazil able to join so now the world is the stage for us uh, that's an opportunity uh, for us as well as a you know uh, a challenge and uh, massive massive uh, movement of consumer sentiment across the last 3 4 years social media has uh, really accelerated and so while you know we talk about e-commerce i think it's more about e commerce uh, so on a lot of on a lot of levels uh, we have transformed and now it's about you know who is investing ahead of the curve and at, at what point of the value chain to uh, transform uh, so it's uh, earlier it was a good to have uh, digitization across the value chain now it's a must have and you have to get on the bus sooner or later not an if uh, but it's a question of when uh no thanks amlan and uh, like uh, maybe mohammed on this we can we can also pinpoint that uh, though amlan has been in the arena at the center of driving things during this period however you on the side uh, even after spending like like decade plus in the arena you took the call of starting your own uh, you know like cpg the company just before the covid i think your experience has been like radically different which is driving your own thing so would love to hear how that impacted your uh, you know like application of your expertise to your own venture yeah Okay, so so uh, yeah, thanks, Amlan. So on on the other side of the coin, so let's 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 look at the uh, let let's look at digitization as consumer facing and non-consumer facing. All right, so so I'll uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll try to hint on on both, and then on on the startup front, why digitization actually made my life a lot easier. All right. so uh, coming into uh, the coming into the world with a completely new product um, used to to be a horrendous task okay so i've launched products before i've launched products with mars i've launched products with red bull and it it was a horrendous uh, job to do all right but guess what for a three people company we managed to do it and that's because of again digitization why on the on the non consumer front uh like i'm i'm not hinted it's a cross functional work and 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 there's a lot of tools now that are readily available off the shelf you don't really need a lot of 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 customization um and now they're integrating a lot of artificial intelligence into them that can manage that for you all right uh, and i'm here i'm talking about accounting systems i'm talking about supply chain forecasting so uh, all the headaches that we used to have an army behind us to do 
uh, it's it's uh, it's helping the speed to market, and obviously it's really helping with the uh, uh, with, with making the process a lot easier and simplifying uh, things for uh, for people like us. All right. Now let's move into uh, the, the the consumer facing. So the consumer facing, you've got obviously your uh, your, your, your e-commerce platforms, but it's more of the storytelling and the brand reputation building, okay? So we used to do that a lot uh, uh, previously, like 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago. I remember just developing the first website for Mars in the region. That was in 2004, yeah? So uh, very early days of HTML, you know, like a few GIFs and it was fantastic, but now, it's a lot more than this. It's a lot more on the uh, interaction, on, on, on how, how the brand is portraying itself. And while the non-consumer facing things made life easier, I think that the consumer facing stuff is making it a lot more complex, all right? Because that reputation management has become the, uh, the key task of brand managers and marketing managers now. Uh, one small little thing, like bad post, uh, uh, and, and now there is a lot of, uh, okay, uh, we don't like, it's a politically incorrect post, so, right? <laughs> and then all hell will break loose, yeah? So, uh, uh, oh, and then you start getting people talking. Or, uh, you, uh, I, I remember... Uh, uh, back in the days, we used to have that consumer uh, uh, hotline, like 800 numbers to call if you have a problem with the, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, I, I remember once, uh, a, uh, so I was the brand manager of, uh, of, of Persil, which is a detergent uh, by Henkel. And um, I got one of the sales guys saying, uh, the guy on the phone uh, is bored because nobody really picks, uh, like picks up the phone and actually call to complain about the product, right? Product reviews was not really a thing. Now, the problem of product reviews is that just, it can kill your brand, all right? Because it becomes a lot easier. And, it, and, and the convenience of just adding that review even Amazon, when you when you buy something, they send you okay, just review it. Yeah, we're encouraging people to review, and uh, and, and and I'll probably will be probably hinting around why reviews are very important because the purchase funnel now is completely upside down, and and that was a very long answer to Hannah's question, but uh, yeah, we have to admit that we're living in a hybrid world. All right, we we have to admit it's not like. Uh, like Amlan said, it's not like it's uh, it's uh, if you go and digitize. No, it's 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 about not even when. It's how big can you do it and how big can you scale it. It will have to happen um, because our consumers are living in these two worlds as companies, as brands, as manufacturers, and obviously as as as, as owners. Of, of those companies, we will have to uh, follow uh, and work on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, very interesting. Uh, like, Mohammed, maybe just like picking on this point, right? Uh, the digitization in CPG has always bifurcated in two parts. First is how do you uh, make your internal operations efficient? Because it's a massive, it's a giant to manage the products. If you start adding more geographies, it becomes a monster very quickly. Uh, then the second part of the digitization is how do you tackle your customers now? Uh, so I think first part is something that the industry has been working on for decades and decades, right? That's a very well researched topic, a lot of competition, uh, you know, high value softwares which are helping the industry. Uh, when it comes to customer revolution, this is very recent. Uh, now, even customer like revolution is also broken down to two parts. First is third party aggregators like Amazon, Noons of the world. And the second is when you are going directly on your website. Uh, now, uh, help me understand uh, why would a brand invest significantly to build their own brand if they already have aggregators and giants like Amazon or Noon or whatever? part of the world you are in uh, doing it for you so what's the ROI what's why would a brand do that 
because the sales are coming in online is coming in so so what's like what are the decision like levers and executive things about uh, when they take such you know investments uh, open for either of you amlan maybe you can take it up if you would like so sure, sure sure i think <clears throat> that's one of the changes that has happened across these last 3 4 years where uh, if you talk about uh not just e-commerce increasing its presence but also d2c as they say in short direct to consumer is coming up and that's a very pertinent question to us uh obviously direct to consumer from a, a pnl point of view makes a lot of sense on uh, uh, on paper because you sort of cut out the intermediaries and hence the margins and hence you save that and you know pnl looks healthy but on the flip side you have to really you know manage everything right from a massive marketing uh, uh engine which works across the value chain versus uh investing in you know depending on the part of the world you are on amazon or a, a tesco or a carrefour or a shop right in uh, africa uh, who will do it for you so uh why has to be very clear and the why is some of the why's are the following uh first of all uh, there is a lot of clutter now and obviously everybody is online now so there is a lot of clutter uh so you need some differentiator for you to be able to con- uh, connect to the customers or consumers directly so if you get the traffic and that's the first part of it if you get the marketing right and you get the traffic into your uh, b2c website then you can traverse them through the entire customer journey in a very different manner without having interruptions from other competing brands i think that's one big one the second is that you can actually uh, you know depending on the customers you'll always be pushed back by retailers on the listings that you can keep online it's a very restricted list sometimes you can keep whereas when you do it on your own you can keep the entire portfolio and range uh, listed online and and that could also mean that you know that is a differentiator how you can get customers to uh, shop uh, uh, online right and uh, you can drive uh, i think just to give some examples you know dollar shave club uh, uh, which was acquired by unilever has a very strong uh, subscription model you can run subscription models to drive more loyalty to your brands so there are these are some of the benefits you have but on the flip side as i said you have to be very careful of the entire cost to serve because it's not just ending at you know getting the consumer engaged but you have to also deliver you have to also care uh, talk about as uh, uh, you know mom talked about the customer helpline you need to have a helpline to answer even return stocks which you don't have to do possibly in a retail environment where the third party is doing for you so uh, i think it's a holistic exercise to uh, find whether it's worth or not there are organizations who have done it very well uh, just few examples you know nespresso for example has been on d2c from almost 30 years back they are still doing well and there are some who have burned their fingers you know nike uh, massive d2c channel but now they are turning back and realizing that they might have alienated their retailers too much which is not also a good thing to do so it's a balance uh, has benefits for sure and uh, i think one of the key takeouts would be that to really not cannibalize your business from one channel to the other you possibly should work on a very differentiated and a customized portfolio offering uh, on a d2c website and rekit has also done that uh, recently we launched a durex uh, range which is exclusively in india uh, through our bombay shaving company partnership uh, on a subscription model so uh, it's very important to unlock that uh, with the right uh, method it's not a black and white situation no no agreed agreed no no i see it is uh, of a nuanced topic like aita if you want to add to this no um, i i i think amlan covered it all the uh, the uh, the only uh, couple of other things that i would add is um well it really depends on on on, on the uh, the purchase funnel itself okay so if the consumers are now so you who where, where are you driving your consumers so they know about you they google or right? they are on the website okay and now it's very easy although costly to 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 manage the entire flow on on your website eventually you don't want them yeah. the attention span of people now online is really really limited okay so if you don't offer that last uh, uh, click all right for shop now and you actually want to sh- to to drive them to amazon or to any aggregators or marketplace right there is a very high chance that you would lose them okay 
they're there, captivated, hopefully engaged by your website and the story you told them. All right, get 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 it done. All right. And then the other side of uh, of things is uh, great. We want loyal customers, right? The 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 only way to actually know more about these customers is they if they're at your home. All right. So you invite them in, get them, have a conversation with them on your website in your home, because you cannot know anything about them from your marketplaces or aggregators. You will know a lot more about their habits, about where did they click, what did they see, and you know, and you can have that conversation with them when they are in your home. So these are two maybe additional reasons to, to, to what Amlan has mentioned that will uh, go for having your own e-commerce or a direct to consumer platform. But also we need to be very mindful of uh, the costs, all right? Because if you don't do it well, uh, we spoke about the reviews, the reviews would be again, detrimental, all right? So uh, uh, I think it is a balance. You either do it well or you don't do it at all. Uh, yeah. But I am for doing it. So uh, I, right. I, I think that managing the whole funnel is is, is amazing. Yeah. Just one more point, Hanender, just to add, and that, yeah. uh, I forgot to put it in the earlier discussion was that uh, as we as we see in the in the world today, the power is in the data, right? And uh, with a lot of privacy laws across, uh, you have to handle third party data in a very different manner, and the cuts and the granularity you can get to versus first party data that is available on a D2C offering is a massive differentiator in some cases. You can test, you can learn much faster on your portfolio. Uh, and that is something that D2C offers. So first party data access is something as a benefit that you will also get if you if you foray into D2C. Uh, just to like, let's, let's just uh, stay on this point because it's very it's very pertinent right which is the PNL decision versus customer experience versus data ownership there are various uh, things to balance it out and like one of the stories that I know at least in the Middle East is uh, is for the Adidas right uh, and since they were able to cut out the middlemen even at as low as scale of 100 orders a day they were able to break even and they were able to deliver the promises you know that because they are in their own web store, they can offer them uh, much more personalized uh, things than they could do on Amazon or on other aggregators. Uh, but this is not uh, right. Uh, like it is not as straightforward as that because it is dependent on what volumes you are able to drive, what margins you can control. So definitely there is this one financial exercise and for some brands, uh, you know, the zone or the phase of breaking even might take way much more longer. Uh, so what it means is you have to hit the execution right mm -hmm. every single time. Uh, so like coming from this point, uh, I wanted to understand like Aita, I know uh, with positive nutrition, uh, you are also trying to, you know, like venture into and have that online presence for yourself. Uh, but for the brands who are either afraid or who do not have a full visibility on when things will turn green from them uh, how do you like decide doing your own versus let's rely on third party for some time and then take uh, take all in house so uh, so even like for a fresh venture uh, like yourself how does that thinking work out Listen, I, I also think it all starts again. So I'll, I'll, I'll always go back to uh, the consumer habits. Yeah. So if uh, it really depends. So we're talking today CPG. All right. But within CPG, there is a lot of subcategories. Right. So uh, it also really depends on the consumer habits within that subcategory. And where do they usually buy? All right. What, where do they get their awareness from? Where do they uh, and what type of consumers are we looking for? All right. Are we uh, are, are, are we talking to the moms? Are we talking to the kids and the teens with the phones? Are we talking to the dads, the granddad, the grandma? 
who are we talking to and what is the subcategory? Is the category a brand category or a brand heavy category or a stables heavy category? So, OK, so I know that I opened up a lot more questions than answers, but I think that by thinking, all right, of defining who you are and who your customers are, that would eventually help you make the decisions and the right decisions, all right? But you need to define who you are, what you want to stand for. Uh, are you a brand differentiated uh, uh, brand, OK? Or are you competing with a very cluttered, uh, within a very cluttered uh, uh, market? And then you're playing the, uh, the value play, OK? Uh, it, th those are all uh, decisions. And also who your customers are. And do they shop for these items and these categories online or not, OK? But this is interesting because that's changing as well, OK? I see. So a few years ago, you would buy a um, few things online. Like I think electronics was the first thing that came into uh, the market. Then I think more and more people started buying their groceries online. Now they are buying. Why do they buy their groceries? Because these are brands they know. All right. So they already have been to the supermarket. They've seen them. They've used them. So it's kind of a repeat type purchase. All right. But now. And, and, and some, some, some fashion brands came online and they did really, really well. But now more and more people are buying even cars online. OK, so so it really depends on if your consumers are buying these things online or not. So don't anticipate the habits or right? anticipate the trend, but don't force something. All right. If they don't buy it online, just just don't be online. <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's interesting, right? Because since we are on the customer, so like let's stay on this topic a bit more, right? Uh, and Amlan did point out about the chaos. Uh, uh, it's quite chaotic out there if you are trying to put your product e even on a supermarket or on an online uh, aggregator. Uh, many of the supermarkets have also doing data analytics and trying to see what customer is buying consistently and trying to launch their own private label. Uh, uh, it's like similar story even on you know uh, you know on the online player. Now the question comes: there is this one world of CPG which is very chaotic, very competitive. Yet you see a very fresh brand just dropping out of thin air and scaling massively. Uh, how how do you know? Like either maybe the question is for you since you have been in the like you have s uh, scaled such brand sensitive products either at like red bull mars or now you're also scaling positive how does that thinking works out uh knowing fully well that like digital is your only tool and your only way to succeed if you have to go viral despite all this chaos which is happening right like water can going viral that's crazy uh who like who would have thought new brand of water can go uh, and scale so rapidly. But yeah, I think like that was one of the questions that really uh, like I wanted to like hear your perspective on. I think I think it all depends on what, what what's your definition of uh, what what went viral, okay? Because um, the the virality is 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 quite uh, uh, it is is quite tricky. So is it going viral for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? That's one. And uh, if it's going viral to the right consumers, OK? So uh, I know that there is a very uh, uh, conventional saying that, uh, that no PR is bad PR, OK? I think I, I think there is a little bit of that in, in, in virality, um, but uh, but virality has also an inherent issue, which is uh, it's not sustainable. OK, um, everyone knows about threads. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah it, 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 it was born, uh, apparently died. I don't know if it did or not <laughs> in one month, which is the uh, the, the, the clone of, uh, uh, of of Twitter. Yeah, and it was meant for the right consumers. And it, so so. I think what we had in mind, uh, especially with the Red Bull days, is to uh, to create something that would last and that would people would not only uh, watch it in a very small 
uh, uh, or or a story that that would that that would be watched only for uh, a few days, okay? Which is probably the blip that you see. And when you're talking about virality, this is what we all have in mind. Like we 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 see something, we forget it uh, in two three days, and then we get the next thing. Um, it's something that has a little bit of a lasting um, a lasting uh, effect. All right, and that is because it's probably the first time that it was done. Uh, or uh, so, so you'll always refer back to it. Okay, remember the first thing that was done. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or, or it made uh, or or it made sense. Yeah. So it made sense for uh, the people. It has a lasting effect on certain lives or something. All right. So so it's a story that would uh, that that would be taken and 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 really have a purpose behind it rather than just you know uh, I want I want that video to have a million view today and then. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, uh, nobody would watch it. So uh, uh, this this is why, yeah, that, that, that's my view usually on virality. Uh, you you can you can have something that is viral for two three days. It will improve your sales for these two three days, maybe a week. Uh, but when you develop stories or when you develop a piece of content, um, yeah. usually what I would be looking at is something that would probably last. It has it has that lasting effect. Right. No, great. I think it makes sense. Uh, now, since we are on the topic of uh, right uh, these these brands like digitizing like themselves, not just on the back end but front end, because that's much much more uh, like challenging. Uh, if we have to stick to the topic, let's extend the like conversation ahead by saying, you know, what does it mean to being an omni-channel player? Now, there's already so much of significant investment a brand is doing to serve the customer online. Now what we are saying is let's unite the physical and the digital world. Why why will a brand undertake and, a, and like correct me if I'm wrong. In my opinion, this is a much more of a stronger investments compared to just starting a parallel online store, which with the given tools and given technologies you can still do. Why to take this pain? Why to unite both the worlds? Uh, I can Maybe take it. Like, uh, not, yeah, please go ahead. Sure. I think uh, the why is very clear now that you know you have people who are uh, mostly on their phones, right? So that's one part of it. And uh, but the face-to-face -face of the retailer is not so going away. And we have possibly, and numbers can vary anything from half to seventy percent of people sometimes researching online and buying offline, or vice versa. So it's about the customer journey, right? So the customer journey has to be smooth across both. And that means the touch point should not break at any point of contact, right? So I myself, for example, when I'm buying from Ikea, you know, I first sort of study what they have on the thing, sort of figure out three, four things that I like, and then go to the store and then check them out to finalize. And it could be the other way around. So it's very important. Uh, and it's not, it's, I don't think it's relevant to say why, because now, Omni is, yes, it's an interesting term that we are given to it, but it's all channel. You know, people are transi uh, transiting from one channel to the other and back, and more so uh, from the offline, online, you know, researching offline, purchasing online kind of situation. So uh, it is a must do. Otherwise, you will lose, and practically the brands which are present on both medium or media, as they say, will benefit because a customer looking for your product will go online, not find it, and will take, uh, you know, pick up a competing brand. So it's it's something that you have to do, and uh, it, it, it and it can it can help you uh, for sure. But if you don't do it, you can get hurt very badly because coming from MNCs who are massively invested in operational excellence offline, with years and decades of experience and rapport with the retailers. Uh, Omni or let's say moving online, the playing field is more level. So if you if you think that you have a massive advantage and hence your brand equity will drive, you know the online consumers also to buy from you, uh, that could be a very big uh, you know problem uh, and and a mindset block that has to go away and has to be invested on. And uh, and their numbers you can look at category wise differences, but. Uh, it's clearly showing that, for example, online is growing faster. So that's one part of the story. 
for uh, you know uh, if you talk about UAE, if you go to any retailers, uh, you know data, Carrefour, Lulu, etc. Everybody is across the world. We see uh, you know uh, e uh, grocery or bricks and clicks growing faster, but the contribution of sales is still offline. It's not that e-com is or m-com is 60% of the sales. So you have to traverse both, and uh, we'll see how it uh, operates. You know the categories like food, beverages. For example, in UAE, are more penetrated online. Personal care, home care are right now lesser, but things will change as we evolve. And these consumers that we're talking about, millennials or others, will transit from one to the other. If they don't have a seamless uh, purchase journey or uh, you know funnel, then they will just shift to the other brands or competing brands. Uh no absolutely uh, uh, i think point taken um, where where you know the like thinking brands are pushing for is if i will not do it others will do it uh, and since the complexity of providing a truly omni channel experience is so complex uh, one has to start the journey now than later i guess that's where the thinking is coming from i think uh, i think cpg learned from fashion uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, the uh, uh, I, I okay so uh, yeah if others will do it okay these others are the competition all right um, there's a lot of uh, small fashion brands that popped up online again because of the accessibility and the market access that is really really easier and uh, and they hurt the big fashion brands so you've got all those uh, little boutiques designers and 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 those guys. Uh, that came in uh, only online. They don't need to invest in uh, a, a, a shop in, on Fifth Avenue or the Champs Elysees, and then they they they've got it, yeah. Um, and, and I think CPGs are um, are are fearing the same. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we we don't want uh, uh, people like Positive Nutrition to come and disrupt us. Uh, we're Gatorade, uh, we're uh, uh, Red Bull, yeah. So that that's pretty much the thinking, yeah. No, absolutely. I think it makes sense. Uh, but but again, you know, uh, the question and the why, uh, as as Amlan also says, right, the why is pretty clear. But when you start translating that why you want to do it as a brand to how, that's where, uh, you know, things become more serious. Investments numbers are not are, you know, are not easy to commit uh, because if, for example, uh, you know, I, if 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 I'm an electronics player, I'm trying to have a big store uh, in Dubai Mall. A customer walks in, uh, selects uh, a washing machine, and you want it like deliver at home by the time you know either tomorrow or by the time they reach home, perhaps. Uh, and if you want to integrate that data on the back end side, it means the supply chain needs to be equipped with the storefront there. Uh, and storefront needs to be equipped with the knowledge of what's there online. Uh, and it's it's quite a hard of a journey, uh, you know, if you have to really execute on it uh, in totality. And to be honest, it's not just the CPG brands who are taking this up. Uh, it is also being taken up by other aggregators as well, where, uh, you know, some of them, for example, like Sheriff DG, since we are on the topic of electronics, uh, they have a massive like physical presence but they have ramped up very quickly in last three and a half years, uh, their online presence as well. And it's quite seamless uh, from that perspective. Uh, no, great, I think uh, I think this is interesting. Just just one point I also wanted to, uh, I wanted to understand is uh, the experience side of things because everything, either it's online or, or like omni-channel, we are keeping customer at the center, which is the right thing to do, right? Uh, we do know that bulk of the physical commerce for CPG brand is handled by a fairly complex offline world of wholesalers, distributors, retailers, and God knows what, right? The value chain is quite massive uh, and, and it has been like running uh, smoothly for decades. How can a brand really think about controlling the customer experience over there? Because it is still quite a big chunk of industry. Uh, like we know brands are pushing the online part and the experience part and my story, your story, you know, whatever. But still, you know, uh, you have outsourced your brand experience 
to this complex offline world? How do like how to manage that? Um, I can I can take it, Hanumar. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, overall, as you rightly said, and from an earlier point, where the bulk of the sales still lies in as we call the traditional channels, and and will be there for a while, depending on the geographies we are talking about. Uh, I think it's about firstly in-house having a team which does not differ between the two, right? So if we talk about a marketing team, the brand manager for, as an example in Reckitt uh, for Detol, will be a brand manager for Ecom also, mm-hmm. right? So, so th- sorry, can you just give me a moment? Sorry, just hold on. Is by the time uh, Amlan joins. Uh, sorry, I'm back. Yeah. Some network issue. Yes, uh, yes. No worries. Uh, sorry. No worries. So I was saying that uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the brand custodians within big MNCs and FMCGs, and also the marketing team has to have a brand presence across all channels, including e-commerce. Right. So e-commerce uh, is not going to be a separate silo, and that's something that we saw in the CPG industry that initially, and these things are changing now. Uh, the e-commerce business would operate some sort of a silo-based approach in a lot of organizations, which now, firstly, it starts in, as they say, it starts at home. So we are combining the, you know, the experience across. So the brand, if you talk about a point of sale material, will say the same thing and we'll have a QR code, which will link to a Amazon voucher, for an example, and not like work totally differently. So that is something that is important in terms of brand presence. In terms of the, uh, as you talked about wholesalers and distributors, uh, a lot of the distributors obviously are more about warehousing and delivery. So there your brand's perspective doesn't really get diluted per se. From a retailer perspective, you have to amplify on the same inflection points, as they say. So, you know, a cleaning festival on, on a shop ride in Africa or, a you know, a Ramadan back to school activation will be similar online as well as, you know, offline and will not be differing. So those lines are blurring because the Amazons are behaving like the Carrefour's, Tesco's and Walmart's of the world. And in some cases are in the same list that the executive committee or the general managers are looking at in terms of the top customers. So it's, I think, as long as we do it from a DNA perspective within the organization, then it's a, it's as simple as, you know, just uh, uh, having the tinge of digitization to it to be added, like I talked about the QR code as an example, and you should be sort of fine as long as you don't differ it in the in the in the organization hierarchy. Got it. Uh, no, no, I love the fact of attacking uh, this problem more from the perspective of having a unified people's approach and having that like DNA, uh, which is quite similar across channels uh no completely like completely aligned to that point uh like i i don't know if you want to add to that uh like to the point of this otherwise you know i i maybe i really wanted to understand uh the perspective of the customer again because we have been on the customer topic in some shape and form uh since since uh, you know the customer sits in the center um uh, i I wanted to understand from the marketing perspective uh, because this has also been shifted a bit fundamentally, right? Fine, we get the part of reviews and sensitivities around how your product can go down the drain uh, if if something is not managed well. Uh, but let's let's pull ourselves a bit out of that. I wanted to just hear your thoughts that at at the level of scaling brands. What has changed? What were you doing five years ago versus what you will do now uh, to really get to the right audience uh, that gets the story of your product differently? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I, I think we've alluded to this uh, many times, Hanander, um, which is the uh, investment decisions. Okay, so where are you going to eventually put your money? Um, uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was all about uh, getting new trucks, yeah, yeah, efficiently. But yeah, get more trucks, get more reach, uh, uh, numeric distribution, uh, uh, buy those gondolas everywhere, and um, life was a bit simpler. <laughs> let's put it this way. 
uh, and now you still have the same money yeah to scale brand okay it's uh, it's exactly the same money um, and now you have many more decisions to make uh, are these the trucks uh, the uh, initial consumer offer uh, new package uh, online campaign uh, or uh, having a brand uh, influencer all right which is something that we didn't speak about at all yeah so getting those influencers to consume your product with absolutely zero additional investment, they can actually help scale your, your brand. It used to be um, a product sponsorships. Now it's much more on product ambassadorship. So uh, they, they are integrated within the brand rather than just being commercialized with the logo or something, yeah, or, or, or that picture, um, and that, that picture on the billboard, yeah. So, uh, uh, it, it is becoming a little bit more complex uh, on on uh, on the choice, and uh, uh, it all goes back to the customers again, uh, because that's what you you, you said how, how how different it is. It really depends on who your customers are and what would influence them. All right, if I am building a brand for a teenager and I'm going ahead distribution in supermarkets guess what it's not going to work those teenagers do not step into supermarkets anymore it's like exactly like buying a press ad okay uh, <laughs> i'd be super surprised if one of the teenagers you know read the papers yeah <laughs> so they don't um so they consume uh, things differently they they even buy differently um, uh, whereas if you were launching something for the family and we know that the gatekeepers of the family is the mom, then it might make sense to, uh, to, to invest in those markets. And, uh, or if it's the dad and the dad stops by gas stations most of the time on the way to work. Eh? So again, then uh, uh, CNG would make sense. So I think it really depends on who your customers are. Uh, which then helps you make the right investment decisions on how to scale your brand. But we have a lot more options now versus just the distrib numeric distribution and getting weighted and numeric distributions and going for retail audit. I remember those days when we used to read the Nielsen data and like, oh, okay, this area, uh, it's, it's not that anymore. Uh, uh, I think very interestingly, uh, since we are on this topic, uh, and 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 I love the part around experimentation, right? Uh, which is even when you are talking about brand ambassador, how do you? Because nowadays, uh, with marketing being like digital, and let's stick to the example of uh, where the product is like targeting, uh, you know, like teenagers. Uh, but it's also about experimenting with what you or how you are influencing the people who would finally pay uh any any new you know like kind of ways that you are you know like uh that you might have seen in the industry uh because earlier it was quite straight right uh, which is monthly budgets this is how i will spend as a brand uh it's quite set in stone uh, like versus now when it comes to digital spend okay i will run 10 experiments of such and such nature yeah. like are you seeing such conversations being more prominent compared to what you saw maybe five years ago absolutely you know uh, a b testing so so something that we call a b testing and by the way a b testing is not only in uh, in uh, digital advertising it's uh, it's even in the whole uh, digital footprint okay uh, you might be seeing uh, when you when you log in um, a completely uh, different website and landing page uh, than uh, than the person next to you all right and uh, that is part of this type of tests um, yeah, because um, it, it goes to the extent of where you're placing the uh, shop button or the that that experimentation i think it's uh, i i i think is really really important but also it's extreme it it can be uh, uh it can be uh, uh, very uh, inefficient uh, because it can create a lot of uh, 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 paralysis by analysis also, right? So, so at, the, at, at, at one point, um, uh, those executives, they need to come together and say, you know what? Okay, just give it time, all right? So, so uh, we cannot just keep testing forever. 
uh, we just need to okay trust also the experience and the knowledge of the people that are sitting on the table and we cannot test everything yeah, we can okay so don't get me wrong no we can test everything but we shouldn't test everything <laughs> Um, because that again goes into a lot more analysis than needed. Uh, that, uh, that 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 some organization I see now. Ah, but did we do this? Did we do that? Okay, fine. Yeah, but we uh, we we can. But you you can also trust the knowledge and the the, the intelligence of of the people uh, around the table. No, absolutely. Uh, look, I think this is one of the topics that can keep going on. And when it comes to like digitization, Amnan right in the beginning did say it impacts every part of the value chain of like CPG and we can go on and on with that. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude at least the question from my side that I wanted to throw at you. Like, thank you for being a uh, good spirit and uh, <laughs> on those answers and being very, uh, you know, like patient uh, with us. Maybe right now, uh, guys, uh, we do have six minutes uh, uh, with us. We can take on the questions that has been posted uh, on the chat. Uh, since there were not many, I took the liberty to push my questions forward. Uh, let's see which one we want to take. Uh, I think this one I really like by Imran. Uh, he just posted the last time around, which is how to how to really think about the impact of uh, what brands are doing online when it comes to like purchasing an impulse category versus a a planned category of a CPG good. Uh, I don't know, like Amlan, if you would like to uh, take this on. So if I if I can just uh, summarize the question is how to handle uh, the purchase of impulse versus non impulse categories, right? Yeah, uh, yeah think, maybe uh, like I will try to contextualize it from the digital efforts at how uh, how things will be like different across the board. Yeah, I think uh, that is where, you know, sometimes we think of e-commerce as a or let's say online as a different animal altogether. But there's a lot of things that we can learn from the offline way of working. Right. Uh, so uh, impulse is impulse because you are sort of uh, putting in your presence at unexpected points, be it in the store or be it a, you know online so from a checkout perspective so those kind of interruption points still work on uh, impulse uh, i think where ecom or online has the benefit is that because there's so much data in the background you have a lot of uh, information that can correlate and you can use ai also on that for example amazon when you buy something comes up with recommendations that similar people bought x with this Y that you're buying. So uh, that can be used both in impulse as well as non-impulse. I think from a, a non-impulse perspective, which are more regular purchases with the frequency is sort of known, uh, a subscription kind of a model or subscribe and save is something that can really work well, uh, be it on your D2C website or even as, as you've seen in players like Amazon uh, can really help. Uh, to drive a customer, uh, you know, loyalty and hence the overall, as they say, the customer lifetime value to a much higher uh, perspective. Uh, I think from a perspective of impulse, which could be, you know, confectionaries and and and, and other segments, um, a lot of times we see, uh, depending on the categories, that the average basket value is higher online. So you can have some bundles or promotions where with relevant categories, you can push some of those impulse uh, items through and that can help, uh, you know, a purchase decision which can lead to replenishment later again on a purchase. So if that person, for for example, buys it, then the AI or the back end data can, you know, uh, locate that as a, a must have next time the person is online on that website to suggest, you know, and we all get those suggestions when we go uh, online. So I think those are some ways and obviously, uh, I, I'm sure Mohammed uh, can uh, add from his experience uh, on this point also. No, absolutely, and I think you're absolutely correct when you when you said about the uh, uh, the impulse buys. Okay, so so um, uh, that shopper's mission uh, that that has uh, impulse uh, impulse buys uh, makes you get a lot more um, uh, within within the basket versus the other planned buys. 
um, would probably look for, okay, where is the best price? So, so they would probably be looking at uh, special discounts or, okay, this website. So I know the product, but this website is giving it at X, while this one is giving it at X plus uh, Y percent or minus Z percent, all right? So I think it all... Uh, the, the also the differentiator uh, adding to what Amlan has said is uh, what content uh, are you showing to that shopper okay so um, how, how how you're closing the deal and and, and is there a, a a competitive advantage of of this specific uh, platform versus the others uh, so the content will be different uh, based on is it a category that is impulse or planned purchase Perfect. No, no, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, uh, I guess uh, maybe I can open the floor for a question, maybe one question, since we have two minutes, one and a half minute. I can invite anyone from uh, the audience if they have something in mind to share with the experts or to ask them something. If nothing in 10 seconds, I'm more than happy to come up with one more as I have plenty. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, maybe <laughs> maybe let me take the opportunity in case someone is uh, if someone has not raised the hand, I just want to make sure uh, if there is none. All right, good. Uh, all right, I think uh, like Imran did make a point on on the chat around you know SKU complexity, uh, like brands that has too many SKUs to manage or handle. Uh, there has to be some level of prioritization. Definitely historical data helps you understand what customer like likes and that's where you can put the bets on. Uh, but how does, you know, uh, like how do organizations really rationalize, you know, those like digital uh, investments uh, when it comes to which SKU or which product category to focus on? Uh, obviously, apart from what has been selling historically, of course. Maybe I, like I can tell you. I can yeah. tell you how we made the decision on positive nutrition. <laughs> yes, yes. But basically, it's also not only from consumer preference standpoint uh, that that's a given, but also from a profitability standpoint. So some uh, some 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 SKUs are much more profitable than the others. So Amran and you choose uh, you choose your best sellers are the most and the more most profitable. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, digital merchandising um, is now uh, becoming a thing. So we used to have uh, merchandisers that used to go to the stores, okay, and then you've got the planogram uh, set up and the category managers would come in and put in the planograms and stuff. The exact same thing is now being replicated in the digital space. So you've got digital merchandisers, they look at the pricing every single day, they look at how they are laid out on the page. So I think what Amlan said is that, yes, there is no line between online and offline now. It's a hybrid world and it will remain to be. So let's not think, okay, these guys are responsible for this and these guys are responsible for that. Whatever is being done on the enterprise level needs to work for both offline and online. Yeah, and I, and I will I will also add to that uh, that uh, the benefit that you have online is that the kind of data and the real time feedback you can get is much much more and faster, and hence uh, you can really learn much faster on on those kind of aspects than uh, what you would do offline. But uh, exactly agree with uh, Mohammed's point. Lovely. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, like immensely enriching uh, for me, hopefully for the audience as well. Uh, thank you so much, Amlan and Aita, uh, for giving out your precious time. I know, Aita, you are on the beach in Egypt uh, on a holiday, so we want to really apologize for breaking that break as well. Obviously, thank you for the wonderful audience as well.